All right, let's do another example. That's the minimum wage, one of the favorite examples. Another important example that's not really relevant in your lifetime so much, but all becomes a political topic at times, is gas price ceilings. I'm sure you, you remember the discussion of, um, you remember the discussion uh, during the, uh, when gas prices were very high a few years ago, there was debates about, gee, we should cap the price of gas. This is too high. Let's do something about this. Okay? We've had that debate periodically when our gas prices get high. But in fact, we actually did something about this in the 1970s. So when I was a kid, long ago, when the dinosaurs hadn't even melted yet and produced gasoline, uh, gas was very, very cheap. Okay? Uh, then something happened. They formed something called the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, which was a cartel of the type we'll discuss in about 10 lectures. Okay? And that cartel got together and raised the price of gasoline enormously in the early 1970s. And people freaked out. Because they were used to paying like 40 cents a gallon or 35 cents a gallon, went up to like a buck a gallon. I know, sounds crazy cheap now, right? But people went nuts. And they said, well, gee, we can't have this. We can't have a gas price rise system. We have to cap it. So let's look at what happened. Let's start with, um, in figure 2.6, you've got the, um, Let's start with basically um, the market before the cap. So this is what happened in 1973. So before 1973, we're at equilibrium point E1. We're at equilibrium point E1 before 1973, a very low price and a high quantity. Then OPEC forms, and they say, you know what? We're going to constrain supply. What OPEC basically did is said, we're going to not produce as much oil. We're just going to shut down some wells and raise the price for us. And we'll talk later about why that was a smart thing for them to do and how that made the money, how actually producing less made the money. Because it raised the price enough, it overcame the quantity they lost. So basically, OPEC said, we're shutting it down. We are only going to produce, we're going to move this new supply curve, S2. And the new equilibrium is therefore going to be at a much higher price and a lower quantity of gas. Well, America at this point, I mean, you had, I had no idea how big the cars were. Now, they weren't like SUV big. But they were like, you've seen the old movies, they were like long. I mean, they were crazy big gas inefficient cars. And people were like, I want my gas. I want to drive all the place for cheap gas. They got upset. So they said to the government, you've got to put in a gas price ceiling. And the government did. The government said, you know what? We're going to fight back against OPEC. And we are, as in figure 2-7, good at putting a gas price ceiling at the old price. It wasn't quite at the old price, but this makes the diagram a little easier to see. OK? We're going to put in a gas price ceiling. We're going to say, gasoline stations, you cannot charge more than the old price P1. We're going to make that P upper bar. That's going to be your price ceiling. You cannot charge more than this. Well, what happens now? Now we have a situation where consumers are like, yay, government. Good job, government. We wanted to pay that price, and you let us. Now we're going to go get gas. And the gas stations say, eh, uh, eh, uh, eh, uh, not so fast. OPEC's still there. They're still making us pay a fortune for our gas. So if you're going to keep the price at P upper bar, we're only willing to sell Q sub S gas, gallons of gas. We're not going to sell you as much gas because we're going to lose money. We can't do that. So suddenly you have a massive excess demand. You have at that price ceiling the government set up, you have people wanting Q sub D gallons of gas, but gas, um, gas stations only being willing to sell Q sub S gallons of gas. And you end up with what? So what's the new equilibrium? Someone tell me, what's the new equilibrium? What's the new equilibrium quantity and price? Yeah. Q sub S. What? Q sub S. Q sub S and the price of P upper bar. You end up with the gas station sell what they're going to sell, and you end up with massive excess demand. OK? Now, I'm going to take this example and talk to you about how this teaches us why government interventions are so can be so damaging in the market. OK? Why they can be so damaging. OK, why is this a problem? Why do we care? So you end up with this excess demand thing. It's just a name on a chart. Why do we care? OK, now later in the semester, we're going to talk about something called welfare economics. Welfare economics, welfare mean, meaning well-being. Welfare economics is how you actually measure well-being through diagrams like this. But we're not there yet. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to talk more generally about what is the damage that's done by this gas price ceiling. And there's two types of damage that's done. Okay, two types of damage. The first 
is lost efficiency. Now, we haven't formally defined efficiency yet, but let me informally define it for you. Efficiency, the efficient outcome, is defined as one where all trades that make both parties happy get made. So in the efficient outcome, all trades that make both parties happy get made. So if you have a trade that I'd be willing to make with Dongyi, and we are unable to make that, then that is an inefficient outcome. Well, here you see this is an inefficient outcome. Because I would be willing to pay more to get more gas. You would be willing, the gas station would be willing to sell me more gas at a higher price. And that can't happen. So since we've moved away from the, perfectly, from the perfect market equilibrium V sub 2, where the market wants to be, there's an inefficiency. Because units, because trades that make both parties better off are not happening. We're going to come in a minute to why this might be a good idea, and I'm showing why it might be a bad idea. Okay? So the, main, the number one cost of this, okay, the main reason it's a bad idea, is that there are, there's a loss to society. And we'll talk later about how you measure the size of that loss. But for now, just understand the concept. Both parties want to trade, and they can't. And that's bad. Okay? So that's the first problem. So the cost side is the cost of trades that don't get made. Okay, Basically, the pie is not getting maximized. If we think about the notion the market economy is maximizing the size of the pie, the size of that pie is not getting maximized. There are, that pie could get bigger with more gas being sold at a higher price. And that's not happening. The second problem, which is a little more subtle, is allocation problems, which is when there's excess demand, who gets the gas? Okay, We've just said people want QD gallons. The station's only going to sell QS gallons. What decides who gets the Q sub S when there's all this excess demand? Now, once again, in the perfectly competitive equilibrium of world E sub 2, that's not an issue. Basically, people who are willing to pay that market price get it. People who aren't don't. And if more people want to pay the market price, the market price will go up. Okay? But in this case, the market price can't adjust to equilibrate those. So we need some other mechanism. Okay? In the 1970s, that mechanism was waiting in line for gas. There were gas lines that would snake around the block okay, as who would wait in line to get their gas because there was a limit to the amount that was available at like that low price. So you had to basically wait in line. Okay? Now, that has two problems. The first problem is you're wasting a lot of gas. <laughs> okay? these, are real, these are huge gas guzzler cars that get like eight miles to the gallon. They're probably using a gallon waiting in line to buy a gallon. Okay, so first of all, that's a huge waste. That's a shrinkage of the size of the pie. That's resources being wasted. Second, and more importantly, people who are sitting in their car online could be engaged in more productive activities that make the pie bigger. People are missing work or missing leisure, missing things that make them happy to sit in a car. Okay, now, side note, they did a study a number of years ago to measure people's happiness. And the way that it is, they put one of these little things on them. And every 15 minutes, it would buzz. You have to check in on how happy you are and how sad you are. And they figured out which things make people happiest and saddest. OK, so there was a big gender difference. What makes guys, what makes women happiest is spending time with their, with their partners, typically male partners, but with their partners. What makes men happiest is hanging out with their buddies. <laughs> Interesting. OK. But what makes everyone saddest, commuting. Everyone hates commuting. Everyone hates sitting in their car because they could be doing something more productive. This is, and of course, this is pre-cell phones. Okay, so you couldn't do anything productive in the car. Okay, at least if you're stuck in a line now, it can be in your cell phone. Okay, not texting, but talking. Um, okay, so there's a major inefficiency of people waiting in line, which is there's productive activities they could be engaged in they're not getting engaged in. And that's another uh, form of efficiency cost. So the costs here are the pie is being really shrunk because you're wasting gas and you're wasting time, which could be going to making a more productive society and a happier society. Now, what's the benefit? Counteracting this is the benefit of equity. 
which is that everyone gets to pay a low price for gas. And if the price goes up, the people who will be squeezed out might be the lowest income people who can't afford it. So this is back to the equity efficiency trade-off okay, um, uh, that I may, I may have mentioned last time, which is the notion that basically sometimes what's the fairest thing to do can also be something which can make the economy operate less efficiently. And you have to evaluate that trade-off. Now, in fact, in this case, it turned out it wasn't very equitable. It's not because a lot of the people who, you know, I mean, in this case, it was, it was equitable because the poor people are the ones who could afford to wait in line, but they weren't necessarily the ones who could afford to pay the extra gas they had to pay while they waited in line. Okay, so it's not clear. It's a pretty bad solution. If your solution is equity, if your question is treating poor people more fairly, there's a lot better way to do it. Okay? So basically, this is going to come to a fundamental debate that will hang over this entire semester and indeed over the entire field of economics, which is the efficiency equity trade-off, which is typically if we want to distribute the pie differently, the pie is going to shrink. Not always, but generally. So the market equilibrium, like point E2, will be what is pie maximizing. It will be the largest, e deliver the largest economy, but not the fairest economy. And if you want to make the economy fair, you probably have to do things which shrink the size of the economy, and that's a trade-off. And once again, this is the annoying feature of this course. It's all about trade-offs. OK? Yeah? What if they put a restriction on the OPEC countries like getting together and saying, OK, we're price? Excellent question. So the other thing is you can attack this as a root course. Indeed, we do this in the US. We have what's called antitrust laws, which keep companies from doing exactly this. Unfortunately, we don't have any, have any uh, jurisdiction over the OPEC companies. So we can't really do that. Now, it turns out it's pretty hard to keep a cartel going. And we'll talk about why in about 10 or 11 lectures. But we have no jurisdiction. We do in the US. So right now, for example, my colleague Nancy Rose is the chief economist of the Department of Justice. Four of the biggest insurers in America propose two different mergers. And she gets to decide if they get to do it or not. Pretty cool. Okay. She gets to decide if that violates antitrust law or not. Pretty exciting. Okay, and we'll come back to that set of issues later.